the best way to learn a language, immersion, living where the language is spoken and using it every day. But if that's not in the cards for you this year, you can still learn a language the second best way, and that's with Babbel. Be a better you in 2024 with Babbel, the science-backed language learning app that actually works. Don't pay hundreds of dollars for private tutors or waste hours on apps that don't really help you speak the language. Babbel's quick 10-minute lessons are handcrafted by over 200 language experts to help you start speaking a new language in as little as three weeks. Babbel's designed by real people for real conversations. Babbel's tips and tools are approachable, accessible, rooted in real-life situations, and delivered with conversation-based teaching so you're ready to practice what you've learned in the real world. For instance, I've been using Babbel's convenient courses to help me learn basic conversational skills in German while I'm getting ready for a little trip I'm planning. It's not a language I'd ever studied before, but I find the lessons really easy and kind of like hand-holding me through learning a completely new language to me. And it's reassuring to know that with the help of Babbel, I'll be able to greet people, order food, and ask for directions without having to consult language apps. While I'm in Deutschland, I'm still learning. Studies from Yale, Michigan State University, and others continue to prove Babbel is better. One study found that using Babbel for 15 hours is equivalent to a full semester at college. Babbel has over 16 million subscriptions sold. Plus, all of Babbel's 14 award-winning language courses are backed by their 20-day money-back guarantee. Here's a special limited-time deal for our listeners. Right now, get up to 60% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners, at babbel.com slash vulgar. Get up to 60% off at babbel.com slash vulgar, spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash vulgar. Rules and restrictions may apply. Hi, I'm Jennifer, a founder of the Go Kid Go Network. At Go Kid Go, putting kids first is at the heart of every show that we produce. That's why we're so excited to introduce a brand new show to our network called The Search for the Silver Lining, a fantasy adventure series about a spirited young girl named Isla who time travels to the mythical land of Camelot. Look for The Search for the Silver Lining on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. Hello and welcome to Vulgar History, a feminist women's history comedy podcast. My name is Anne Foster and this is Empress Cece Part 2 with special guest Lana Wood Johnson, Cece superfan and Habsburg expert. So last time we kind of, we laid all the groundwork for what, what's going on, where are we in the world, what era are we in, what's going on with a Bavarian royal family, etc. And this week we really get into what Cece did as Empress of Austria. So there are numerous content warnings and we're going to bring them up during the episode as they happen. The all the time codes will be in the in the show notes so you can just look down there if you want to like skip ahead. I don't know, you could go to like 5 minutes from the end if you just want to hear the wrap up, but I mean like spoiler, there's going to be a part 3. So anyway, here's me and Lana talking about CC. Now, quote unquote political meddling which is how it was described in some stuff. And I like, <laughs> I wanted to reclaim that. Hey, being a queen. <laughs> yeah, meddling. Early in her reign, Cece developed a deep interest in Hungary. This is where you're going to jump in all over the place, Lana, please. Which was then a rebellious part of the empire. So she was interested in Hungary partially because one of her childhood tutors, like back when she was living with her family where she was happy, had been from Hungary originally. And so he was teaching her like whatever history and things, but just inherently from a Hungarian point of view. So she like had some interest and some knowledge in it. Um, in 1857, she visited Hungary for the first time with her husband and two daughters. And this was, seems like it was her idea because Sophie was just like, what the fuck are you doing? Why are you going to fucking Hungary? And she's just like, it's the thing we're doing. Bye. And this left a deep and lasting impression on her probably, or perhaps because in Hungary, she found a welcome respite from the constraints of Austrian court life. Like, frankly, she could have gone and hidden under a train bridge somewhere and been like, oh, I feel better. Like if she just got out of that palace, like anyway, Hungary was a place where people were nice to her and she could like breathe again. At the beginning, at the beginning of the Habsburg Empire, Hungary was this tiny little backwards nowhere, like nothing part of the empire. And then, and and then 
great grandpa lost the Holy Roman Empire to Napoleon, and now Hungary's half of the empire, like a, a, like at the equal in size to Austria, equal in power, equal in earnings, and they they don't have as much of an excuse to treat them like a backwater nowhere as they did when they had Spain and Holland and <laughs> yeah, like so all of those parts. Proportionally, it is suddenly much more important to them. Yes. It, and it's, it's power, it's relative power is increased significantly. And I would say CC recognized that in a way that perhaps other people did not. Um, but also she just like liked it there. They seem nice. So she went to Hungary, both of her daughters who were both like babies slash toddlers, they both became ill. Sophie was like, you shouldn't have taken them there. So Gisela recovered quickly, but two-year-old Sophie grew steadily weaker and then died probably of typhus. Someone did not wash their hands. <laughs> that is like, I'm thinking of re- doing a new vulgar history bingo card. And I think someone didn't wash their hands. Semicolon <laughs> death is going to be on it. Anyway, so this was a further wedge between her and her mother-in-law because the mother-in-law especially liked baby Sophie because it was like the baby she had named after herself. Anyway, Cece, guess what? Got really depressed, like because she had, like, I'm sure she had like postpartum stuff going on. Anyway, she had her like ongoing mental health concerns, and then like, her toddler just died. And Sophie, I'm sure, is being like, "It's your fault for taking her hungry." So at this point, it seems she turned away from Gisela, her only living child, um, began neglecting her, and the relationship never recovered. She like basically was just like pushed her away, and every time. We're going to, like, the next part, we're going to get into, like, her coping mechanisms. Anyway, she turned towards these coping mechanisms, especially when she was depressed, which from this point on, she is a lot. When she experiences bouts of depression. (laughs) Yes. She experiences bouts of depression, and they are sometimes triggered by the deaths of people who she loves. And this is one of those. I just want to talk a bit more about Hungary before we get into that stuff. So. She was just like, I really want to get a Hungarian woman to join my entourage, like a little more servants who are like Hungarian. Like she just really saw their importance and she liked them. And so I love this detail because it's so mysterious. So she's like, I want to get a Hungarian woman as my lady in waiting. And so she's presented with a list of names of like upper class, like the highest echelon of Hungarian women. And at the bottom of the list written in a different handwriting was the name of Ida Ferensky. So no one knows who wrote that name there or why, because she was like... She was um, a Hungarian noblewoman, but she was nowhere near as high class as the other people on the list. And Cece was like, I choose her. And they became great friends from Ida, which is maybe Ida. I'm not sure. They became very close. I cannot help you with Hungarian. Hungarian is an entirely different language from every other language in Europe, except for Finnish. And I can't help with Finnish either. The names, when I started getting into the Hungarian people, I'm like, oh, this is bringing me back to the Elizabeth Bathory episode. Like the names look similar to that. Anyway, so Ida, I'm going to say they became very close. Um, and Cece learned to speak fluent Hungarian from her, as well as more information about the country. Such that upon a later visit to Hungary, she impressed slash surprised everyone because she like gave opening remarks in completely fluent, like perfect, flawless accent Hungarian. And everyone's like, wait, when did? When did Cece learn Hungarian? And she's just like, guess what? I have an affinity for languages. And everyone always underestimates me. It's well, a thing they let me do. Yeah. <laughs> While I'm having my hair done, I learn languages. Anyway, we'll talk about that too. But um, while there on the second or the subsequent visit, she met the dashing Hungarian statesman, Gyula Andrasi, who would become one of her close friends like for the rest of her life. He was also, I have to say, a smoke show. He was very good looking. Not a coincidence. Cece preferred to only hang out with very, very extremely good looking people. That's a preference she had. Anyway. Her face are problematic. (laughs) (laughs) But Gula Andrasi was like a cool friend to her. They were very close. He was a, they like, he respected her and cared what she thought. And they like worked together. And that was like good for her. She's got like a friend. In 1934, so just to give you future information, this guy wrote 
So a man named Patrick Lee Fermer visited Hungary in 1934. This is like decades after Cece's death. And he noted that her pictures of her were framed on desks and tables and grand pianos, and her love for Hungary and Hungarians was returned with interest and still declared 36 years after her death with all the ador, ardor of Burke for Marie Antoinette. I don't know who Burke is. But basically, she was beloved by Hungary, like even years after she died. People just like, remember her. She was great to Hungary. In December 1857, Cece became pregnant for the third time in three years. And she's still, what, like 20 years old. And her mother, who had been concerned about her like ongoing, obvious, visible health issues, hoped that this new pregnancy would help her recover, which is like the opposite of what pregnancy does to people with health problems, (laughs) slash mental health problems, which brings us to- That's not how hormones work. (laughs) gigantic content warning for disordered eating, body dysmorphia. What else, Lana? Uh, Anorexia, anorexia, the exercise anorexia, as well as, as um, severe disordered eating and fat phobia, like so much fat phobia that she would hate me. And that's okay. I still love her. She, I mean, (laughs) you have that in common with Queen Victoria. Don't tell me I have things in common with Victoria. <laughs> well, thank, I mean, see, not all I have in common with Victoria. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so this is just, this is a content warning for all of that stuff. So we're going to put the timestamp for this in the episode. So you can just like skip ahead and you'll know when you can come back. Or if you just want to skip ahead to the scoring, we'll put that timestamp in as well. And so we're going to talk about. I we're not getting into like the CC diet, which is like so much of what I read was just like, here's what she ate and here's what she exercised and here's her weight and her waist measurement that I don't give a shit. That's not what we're talking about. We're just talking about how her mental illness manifested is not as interesting as the fact that she was, she was dealing with a mental illness and working around it for the rest of her life. Exactly. To extreme degree. Exactly. And I think based on like when people, when newspapers wrote about her in her era, they were like, here's her diet, here's her exercise plan. And I think it was, was with the intent of like other people should do it too. No. And I really, <laughs> which is like, no, she has. Okay. So Cece was, this is notable. And I find it interesting five foot eight. So she was tall for anyone. She's as tall as me. <laughs> really? Yeah. I didn't know you were five foot eight. Yes. Is that I'm why you're drawn to Mary Queen of Scots as well? Also a yeah, tall woman? all the tall ladies. Oh, no, I'm drawn to Mary Queen of Scots because my family all thinks that I'm related to Mary Queen of Scots, even though I've definitively proven that we're not related to Mary Queen of Scots, but they still argue with me. Well, your family is German. My family is every Northern European okay. that is not does not touch the Mediterranean. Yeah. It's, it's Irish, English, Scottish, Swedish, Norwegian. <laughs> Dutch, German. So you've got but a lot it's of German on all four sides. And and I feel like the German people are tall. Or like the Scandinavian people are tall. Um, German people have tend because they are a very agrarian society, um, tend to have adequate diets as young people. Height is very strongly correlated to the adequacy of your diet mm. when you're young. And, and breastfeeding and a lot of these other, these other characteristics. So when you're not malnourished, you tend to grow taller. So Germans historically have been taller because like their nobles ate vegetables. Yeah. <laughs> like, that was a weird trait about Germans is that their nobility also ate vegetables. They didn't just eat meat and bread. So like everybody ate vegetables, everybody ate meat, everybody, well, not everybody, but like more people ate meat. So every more people were much taller, not yeah. quite Swedish tall where everybody grew up on cow's milk and just giant bones. But yeah. So Cece was five foot eight, which I'm going to say based on what everything you just told me was maybe not that weirdly tall. For a Bavarian woman. I mean, era. it's taller for the, it's, it's taller than normal, but like it's tall for a woman in general. Yeah. True. On the true. upper end of, 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 it's not uh, like super tall, but like my, my best friend is six one. So <laughs> or six foot. So like <laughs> uh, women, women can be any height, but on the average, she, she. Leans yeah. So she, she would be a tall woman for now. She would be, she would have been a tall woman for then. So she was 
in terms of just like the effect she had on people, I think it would be, like, oh, we're going to talk about what she looks like later. Well, I'll say right now, she had ankle length hair. She had the hair of full, massive ankle length hair, not like the thin scraggly and it grew that long. It was, it was a mane. Yeah. Every and portrait. Curly. Like yeah. she curly girled. She, yeah. She, so if you just picture it, like before I even talk about any of this other stuff, if you picture a five foot eight woman with a very pretty face walks into a room and she has ankle length, like she has the hair of like a Barbie doll, but longer, like voluminous thick. It's just like, this is going to turn heads. Like she is a striking looking person. Also the hair is what I think (laughs) to me before I learned all this stuff was part of mostly what I knew about her. Anyway, so she's tall. She was also very thin because of, well, I don't know. I think maybe she was slim. She, she was she ex- had a very tight. She she had a very small waist. She was a tight corset person. So, um, what people think historical corsets were like, she was that person. Oh my god! Yeah, to yeah, what yeah. Actual corsets were like. So she was she was like fuller up top, fuller in the hips, and very the very slim waist. Yeah, which is no. different than being just thin. It's it's. It's a it's it's a different aesthetic than being someone who who is is a lot more straight. She was like hourglass. Definitely. And this is why I'm glad you're here as well. So Lana, I forgot we didn't say at the beginning, but people probably know. You're one of the co-hosts of Vulgar Peace Theater on Patreon. And almost every movie we've done so far has had some sort of like historical undergarments moment. And that's where you shine. <laughs> I didn't know that was a strength of mine, but historical undergarments, here I am. But so Cece, um, yeah, so she did tight lacing. So there's this, like, it's a pet peeve of so many, like, historical costume people I know. Uh, I don't know, costume designers I follow on social media and stuff, where it's just, like, in Bridgerton, like, in Bridgerton, in the Regency era, they're like, oh, let's pull your corset tighter. It's like, you realize that the dresses don't have waists. Like, that's not, but all those, the things about, like, holding onto the bedpost while like five servants pull like CC did that. It took like three hours to get her laced as effectively as she wanted to be. Regular corsets weren't strong enough for what, for the look she was going for. So she went to, she said, I want the, what the courtesans in Paris have, like, what are they doing? I want that. And what that was, was leather. Mo- modern day equivalent is Violet Chachki from yeah. Drag Race. Like yeah. very much that tight lacing trainer, Super aesthetic, super, super stiff to keep it going. Violet Chachki. If she could have, she would have had her bottom ribs removed. Level. Yes. Oh, if that was a thing, yeah. she would have had her, her body dysmorphia was ex- very extreme. And yeah. if if um plastic surgery had been allowed, oh, yeah. As much as she liked natural being natural looking, if plastic surgery had been allowed, it, it would have been a strong temptation for her. Definitely. So she, and even with the leather corset, it was t- laced so tightly, like even like this, you needed that strength to support all the body mass that was being distended, but also eventually those would wear out as well. So she, that was a thing she did. And which is also interesting that that's her preference because her mother-in-law expected her to be continuously pregnant. And she was mm-hmm. just like, guess how not pregnant I am right now. So disordered eating patterns were a thing that happened. Were a th- I don't know, a thing she did. This was a manifestation of her mental illness for her whole life. She, she was very like cal- calorically restricted. She would do fasting when, when it was, when she didn't match up to this mental equivalent in her head. It's also probably interesting to note that Sophie was not a small woman. And so there's probably a manifestation of that as well. I am, I am not a small woman. So when I say like she, Sophie was probably also fat, um, Queen Victoria, (laughs) that, that kind of, there was, there was a trend at the time, not to be slim, not to be skinny. That was not the trend at the time. That was not what you wanted to be. You wanted to have some, some weight to you. So you wanted to like your wealth. Yeah, exactly. So this, it's not like other examples of like 
people who lose a lot of weight because it's like heroin chic or whatever. It's not, it's not like everyone wants to look really thin. It's like, no, Cece was doing this because this was how her body dysmorphia was manifesting. She didn't want to look like this to fit in or to like to impress other people. It was just like, this is what she wanted. That's how she felt her body should look. Yeah. And she was going to do whatever it took to achieve that. Just one sec. And it was not, it was not to match trends. It was not like today in this day and age, it's a very different manifestation of the same things. So today, especially in the nineties, it was very looked up to the CC diet, her exercising, her dysmorphia was, was glorified. Nowadays we would glorify it, but we would understand it. But that back then it didn't make sense. It it was interesting to read about the stuff she did, like the caloric restriction. So she did a lot of exercise all the time. And that's such a main, right. But it's such a mainstream thing. Like you and I are similar ish ages, but like growing up in the eighties, nineties, the early two thousands, it's just like, every woman's magazine is like, here's how you exercise to lose weight. And here's how you diet to lose weight. So it's just like, that's just what life is like. And life should not be like that. And that's a shitty way to live. But um, CC was doing this at a time where it was mainstream. So everyone was just like, oh, what is she doing? Like, like it confused people because they weren't familiar with, obviously with like mental illness, they didn't know about anorexia, let alone, even the fact like, it was scandalous that like a woman was doing exercise. Everyone's just like, what a woman? Like she had like balance beams or whatever. Or like she was like doing exercise was a thing men do for military training. It wasn't a thing women do. Yeah. She's doing like reason. calisthenics. Like that was mm-hmm. shocking to people, but it was with the, it was a manifestation of this body dysmorphia disorder eating stuff. Um, she only wanted to be around attractive looking other people. When her daughter Gisela first met Queen Victoria, um, Gisela was terrified because Cece had just like trained her daughters to also be horrified by fat people. Screaming and running away from Victoria, I understand that part, but because of her size, that that I disagree with fundamentally. Cece and Victoria- That's not this episode. (laughs) No, that'll be a whole other thing. Um, <laughs> I don't think I have this in all my notes, but like later on in her life, when Cece was spending a lot of time in England, she kept standing up Queen Victoria. It's like a fabulous series of just like, she's just like, I don't feel like seeing her. So I'm just going to like knock out. She would like ghost Queen Victoria. It's like. Now you see why I like her. <laughs> yeah. I'm starting to understand. So she had the disorder eating, the fasting. She had the leg, like the exercising. Again, I don't want to get into the details, but it's like hours a day. Of just like very and, and horseback riding. She was she was very physical. She had to keep moving. It was part of it. It was part of her attempt to look. I and she said this before her attempt to continue looking exactly like she did when she was basically fifteen. Like when she walked through the door, she never wanted to change. And yeah. and there's a lot of psychological pieces of that that manifest like. This was when she was happy, was when she was tiny, when she looked like this, when she felt like this, when she, when she exercised and ran into, but she couldn't climb trees as a 32 year old queen. So she had a balance beam and yeah. And then that stuff. Yeah. And I think it also connects to, if we're just like, we're not deep diving into her psychology, but like, there's an element of like desexualization to what she was doing as well, where her body was, if she wanted personalization. Yeah. So if she wants to be like the person she was when she was 15, like before she became the empress, before she had to move here, before she had Had children. children. Yeah. So there's like a couple of people later in her story where people are like, Ooh, is it her lover? And I'm like, I feel like she is not a sexual person whatsoever. she, She likes to be around pretty people. But she has a lot of characteristics that that would make me not surprised if she identified as asexual. Yeah. Or on that spectrum. Yeah. So again, like she, so we're going to talk next about her beauty regime, which I think I'm going to keep within the content warning era of just like CC psychology. Yes, because it's still body dysmorphia. It's, it's an, ex, it's, it's a different kind of manifestation. Yeah. So she was obsessed with looking like she was when she was 15. She was obsessed with her own personal 
beauty, but again, it wasn't to attract people. It wasn't to be alluring. It wasn't like she hated like when people looked at her when she was out, but she was just like, this is, yeah, this is what I want to look like. So her hair, daily care was three hours a day. She washed it like once a month. There's all these, like, you can Google this. It's like, here's what her shampoo was made of. Like, who cares? But, um, but it took a whole day to shampoo her hair. Like it was, it was a whole, like, yeah. It was a whole process. No, that's the thing where you're just like, oh, I can't go out tonight. I'm washing my hair. It's like true for her. And I love this detail though. So she, they went to the theater and she saw the main actress in this play had this great hairstyle. She's like, who did the hair? And it was this woman, Franziska Feifelik, who was just like a stage hairdresser, like a lower class person who just like was skilled. And Sisu's like, and I'm going to hire her and she's going to be my, and that was, that became her job. She got like an official job. Bring the palace, like she was the one who would tend to Cece's hair every day. Um, Francisca would create, so it became like a art partnership almost. Like not quite. At first, I was like, oh, this is like a famous like stylist actress relationship, where she's creating these looks for her. And Cece had stunning dresses. There's this famous thing she had the Cece stars, these like diamond encrusted stars. I forget how many they're like twenty five. Or something that she would just like pin throughout her hair. So she walks in a room and you're just like, oh, is this like literally a Disney princess come to life moment? Like ankle length hair with diamond stars. Anyway, so Francisca, they became very close as you would if someone is like spending three hours dealing with your hair that is so important to you. Um, Francisca would accompany her on her wanderings. She's always with her. She's forbidden to wear rings and required to wear white gloves. The hairs that fell out when she was combing her hair had to be presented in a silver bowl to Cece for inspection. And she was always mad if any hairs came out. I read that Francisca would, as she's combing and hairs came out, she just like tuck them in like her bodice just so Cece wouldn't, so she could present her with a... Uh, also that, that body dysmorphia of she doesn't want to change. She doesn't want her, her body to change in any way. Yeah, she doesn't want to lose a single hair, but Francisca figured out how to work around that. Um, During the hours-long hairdressing sessions, Cece worked at learning languages. She spoke fluent English and French, added modern Greek to her. She'd already learned Hungarian. So her Greek tutor, Konstantin Christomanos, described the ritual. Hairdressing takes almost two hours, she said. And while my hair is busy, my mind stays idle. I'm afraid that my mind escapes through the hair and onto the fingers of my hairdresser, hence my headache afterwards. The empress sat at a table which was moved to the middle of the room and covered with a white cloth. She was shrouded in a white lace peignoir. Her hair unfastened and reaching to the floor and folded her entire body. The amount of hair, like it would obviously give her headaches unsurprisingly. So they would do like a thing where they would like pin it all up and she would lie down and that would help. So it's, yeah, it's just, everything is like, it's another extreme, right? It's another like, this. no one expected you to have ankle length hair but this is what she wanted to look like growing up one of my mom's friends had like butt length hair and during the winter she'd wrap it around her neck like a scarf so it wouldn't get caught in her zippers yeah like it 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 becomes its own personality like this own thing you have to deal with and work around for your entire life absolutely one of special ways to sleep yeah, it's yeah, it's like a I don't know, it's it's an extra limb. A friend of mine during the the when the pandemic started, she already had long hair and she just didn't get it cut for a while. And then eventually it became like butt length hair. And when she was like, okay, I'm sitting on my hair and I want to sit, she like decided to get it cut. But yeah, it was such a thing. So Cece used cosmetics and perfume sparingly as she wished to showcase her natural beauty which I think also comes back to being like the fresh-faced 15-year-old that she was. She didn't want to look. So her whole thing was natural beauty. And then by age 32, she decided she did not want the public image of her beauty challenged. So therefore, she did not sit for any more portraits and would not allow any photographs. This um, when the whole um, the, the paparazzi. paparazzi incident ha- happened and she like covered her face with a fan. Yeah. So that's the thing. Like in her later years, she would... She would walk around with a fan to cover her face and a white parasol. So it was just like fan, parasol. It's just like, okay, that looks like that's very good at it. (laughs) I think we're emerging from this passage. So this can be the second time stamp for people who want to rejoin us after that. 
And now we're just going to take a break for a word from our sponsors. As a podcast network, our first priority has always been audio and the stories we're able to share with you. But at Realm, we also sell some pretty cool merch, and organizing that was made both possible and easy with Shopify. When you think about successful businesses like Allo or Allbirds or Skims, an often overlooked secret is the business behind the business that makes selling, and for shoppers, buying, simple. For millions of businesses, that business is Shopify. That's because nobody does selling better than Shopify. It's the home of the number one checkout on the planet. And the not-so-secret secret that's definitely worth talking about is that ShopPay boosts conversions up to 50%. That's more happy customers and way more sales going... If you're hoping to grow your business, your commerce platform better be ready to sell wherever your customers are scrolling or strolling, on the web, in your store, in their feed, and everywhere in between. Businesses that sell more, sell on Shopify. Upgrade your business and get the same checkout we use with Shopify. Sign up for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash realm, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash realm to upgrade your selling today shopify.com slash realm hi i'm jennifer a co-founder of the go kid go network at go kid go putting kids first is at the heart of every show that we produce that's why we're so excited to introduce a brand new show to our network called the search for the silver lining a fantasy adventure series about a spirited young girl named isla who time travels to the mythical land of camelot During her journey, Isla meets new friends, including King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table, and learns valuable life lessons with every quest, sword fight, and dragon ride. Positive and uplifting stories remind us all about the importance of kindness, friendship, honesty, and positivity. Join me and an all-star cast of actors, including Liam Neeson, Emily Blunt, Kristen Bell, Chris Hemsworth, among many others, in welcoming the Search for the Silver Lining podcast to the Go Kid Go Network by listening today. Look for the search for the silver lining on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. People often look at me with confusion when I ask them what their only one in the room story is. They think it has to be like mine, where I went to a 600 person event and discovered that I was the only black person there. I know, horrifying, right? Hi, I'm Laura Cathcart Robbins, and I am the host and creator of the podcast Only One in the Room. Every week, my co host Scott Slaughter and I invite you to join us for an hour and lose yourself in someone's only one story. This podcast is for anyone who's ever felt alone in a room full of people, which is to say that this podcast is for everyone. I'm Brennan Storr. I'm Paul Bestall. We're the Ghost Story Guys. And every two weeks, we explore first-person stories of encounters with the paranormal from all around the world. Then we have some fun reacting to those stories. We like to say our goal is to scare the hell out of you, then make you laugh. Belief in the paranormal is not required. All you need is a love of great storytelling and curiosity about the world around you. Come find the Ghost Story Guys on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere else fine podcasts live, or at ghoststoryguys.com. And we're back. So Franz Joseph was, quote, passionately in love with his wife. Mm. Obsessively in love with his wife? Obsessed with her, with his wife. With her beauty. He also liked her personality. Like, he, he, he was a fanboy of his wife. Yeah, yeah. And in, like, an okay way. Not in, like, a AC or Tons Mancini way. He was, like, Yeah. Um, he was not like, you know, knocking out her teeth so nobody would admire her or whatever. So she did not reciprocate his feelings fully and felt increasingly stifled by the rigidness of court life. But again, like just personality wise, and it's like they married when she was 16 and he was 23 or whatever. She's like become an adult person now and her personality is more solidifying. And she's just like, um, she was described as being restless to the point of hyperactivity. She was naturally introverted. Just like these were her personality traits and they didn't go with this like army guy who's just like a very, compared to her, very straightforward person. I mean, he was a really good Habsburg. For all the Habsburgs that you haven't seen that many, but like 
some of them were just flighty jerks. Like he was actually good at it. He was not a bad dude at all. I have to say he's like the fact that he's like an okay person and like a decent leader. I'm just like surprised and impressed. He didn't know how to make his wife love him and he didn't know how to make her life better. And he didn't like meet her as a person, but he really liked her. Like he liked that she existed. He liked being around her. (laughs) Yeah. He didn't have the capacity to see why she was fundamentally unhappy with the life that he gave her. He wasn't equipped to, he, he wasn't equipped in any way to like help her, but he didn't treat her like, he didn't treat her like a child and he didn't treat her like an object. And And that was really important. Yeah. And then we're going to get, I'll say it now, even though it's in my notes later, is that um, she, as she grew up, she (laughs) became an adult after years of marriage. Um, She came to understand better how to um, deal with him, which was just like, he had been like, not coddled isn't the right word, but just like he had been brought up as like the heir and whatever. And he was used to everybody. I was doing what he said. So when she challenged him, she was just like, I want this, give it to me. He'd be like so startled and surprised. And he liked her. He'd be like, okay. He liked having someone that would challenge him. He liked having someone that would talk back. So she, as as their relationship developed and as she matured, she realized like, oh, I can do this. Like I don't, yeah. She wasn't married to Sophie. It's not a problem. (laughs) Yeah, she's not married to Sophie. Like he actually will like do stuff for her sometimes when she asks very clearly. Yeah. So she didn't like her duties of life at court. She avoided that as much as she could. There was a lot of like, oh no, I have a toothache. Sorry. I can't go to that thing, which is partially just like she hated it. And partially just like she knew there was this, she had developed this expectation that she would show up in this show stopping look. And she knew it would take extra hours to have her hair prepared for that. And it's just like, I don't want to go through that. Like, so it's like, I'm just going to not, I'm going to opt out. He constantly unsuccessfully try to tempt her into a more domestic life with him, but that was not for her. Um, She slept very little and spent hours reading and writing at night and took up smoking, which I don't know if at that point people knew it could be a weight loss technique, but maybe that helped with her anxiety. I don't know. Um, But this helps giving oral fixation to, to not have some, not eat. Yeah. It, Like she would have figured that out real fast. Yeah. So this was a shocking habit for women, which made her the further subject of already avid gossip. But Um, the thing she ever did was ever going to make her not the subject of gossip. So might as well do whatever you want. Might as well. If that makes her feel good, then okay. So then 1858, she gave birth to a son who was named Rudolph. And this um, signaled an increase to her influence at court because she had to deliver the heir. She did her um, job. She did her job, but then, like in a very canny way, now that she knew that she had a bit more influence and power, and she had this interest in Hungary, this made her an ideal mediator between Hungary and her husband. So she had this friend Andrasi, who she like wrote to, and they were like, he was like a good friend. This is, I'm honestly really happy and surprised that this is the third episode we've had with like a young-ish woman who has, like, a platonic male friend who is, like, a good dude. Like, I like it. We've had Christina had Azzolino, and then Hortense had AC, and now she's got Andrasi, just, like, a guy who is just, like, not trying to sleep with her, but was, like, just, like, a good friend. Or take advantage of her. Like, not, he's not, he's not going into this going, I could be made premier of Hungary. It's like. Yeah. Like, she genuinely. I like Hungary, you like Hungary, let's work together to make it better. Exactly, exactly. And she had the son and she's like, okay, like I have a bit more power and influence. So like, let me just like use my skills I have now to like convince my husband to do stuff. Yeah. So her interest in politics had developed as she matured. She was liberal minded and placed herself decisively on the Hungarian side in the increasing conflict of nationalities within the empire. Can I just point out, this is the time where nationality suddenly became a thing. Like beforehand, there was these people that were high above, transcended everything like kings and emperors and whatnot. Yeah. And now this is the time where where German identity, like Bismarck was consolidating Germany. And in the middle of all of this, Franz Ferdinand was like, 
or France Ferdinand, France Joseph, France Ferdinand's not till later. <laughs> France Joseph was um, like fighting Germany, or fighting Prussia for influence over Germany, and Italy was fighting for liberation because they owned parts, they own parts of Tuscany and yeah. Lombard region, Lombard region, and they lost that because Italy became Italy. Like it wasn't Italy before, and now it is, and like all of these places are starting to get a national identity as opposed to like this, these weird, either small parts or yeah. like way too big parts. And so Hungary was sitting in the middle of this going, well, you lost everything else. Why don't we, why don't we rebel? Like, why don't we become our own thing? Cause, and, and this, this was a chance, like, this was the question of the time is, do you stay with, these foreigners who own you or do you break off and become your own thing? Yeah. This is such a, like this time period. And this is one of maybe the most recent story I've ever done on the podcast, but it's really, it's that shift from like the, what I consider like oldie times to like a map of Europe that I would recognize where it's like this country, this country, this country, instead of just like all these kingdoms or whatever. Thank you for that context because This is, we'll remember this when we get to her scoring for significance, because she was like all like this Hungarian, this wouldn't have happened without her. Like she was actively making this happen because she really was on the side of the Hungarians. Well, and the Austrians thought they were too good for the Hungarians. So there was no one to, there was no one to advocate for them within Franz Joseph's circle. Except for her. And he appreciated her and listened to her. So whenever difficult negotiations broke off, like, because everything you just described, like, I'm sure these negotiations were quite heated, but the, the talks are always resumed with her help. She suggested to her husband that her friend Andrasi be made premier of Hungary as part of a compromise. At one point, she strongly admonished her husband, like she was all over this, situa- like doing things. This is where it's like, people are like, oh, Cece, she had long hair, like, and it's like, and she like did this she like made austria hungary happen if, if this was what she could do all the time she probably would have like her life yeah. would have been very very different exactly 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 so that's hungary and then just other examples of her like as she matures and like grows into herself and like gets more confident So her son, Rudolf, was being raised like the father had been raised, where it's like military, blah, blah, blah. And he was just, he was like her. Like Rudolf of all the children was like the most like Cece. He was very in that Ludwig kind of, he was just like- He he had the Wittelsbach tendencies towards hyperactivity, obsession. Daydreaming. uh, like Daydreaming. Yeah. Inability to focus in a structured environment, which- probably ADHD. <laughs> right. So it's just like CC she was in a position like at this point where seeing that this the educational style was not allowing her son to thrive, shall we say, and seemed to be damaging him. She like I and this is a letter. I think I saw like the actual letter written, but she was just like here's what's happening. I'm taking over full control of his education. Here's what it's going to be like and you're going to let me and this is happening. And her husband was like, "Okay, Like, go right ahead. So she intervened to um, let her take over his care, which was, again, the thing of just just like... Good and bad. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But this is just an example of her, like, I don't know, figuring out how she could exercise some control over things that were not her own body. She didn't give up. She never gave up on anything. Like, with her husband, I, I think that's what this comes down to is, like, she kept trying things. And she kept trying things and she kept trying. And then she found what worked and she's like, oh, okay, then I'll do this. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't, oh, well, Sophie won't let me do anything. So I'm just going to ride horses all my life. It was, okay, so how do I fight Sophie? How do I, how do I get influence over instead of Sophie? It's like, okay, well, I got to have at least an heir. Like she, she kept trying new stuff. She never, she never just gave up. And that's the thing. That's part of what you said when I was first asking, like, what's, why do you love her so much? I think you said like, she had, like, she was living with these mental health things and she also never gave up. 
Well, and that's what, like with mental, with mental illness, I, I also deal with anxiety. I deal with a lot of, of different things and you can either give into that being who you are, or you can use them as your superpowers. <laughs> like when you have, when you have, when you, when you constantly catastrophize things, you're really, really good at planning for the worst case scenario so that they don't happen. Like mm-hmm. it's, it can become your superpower if you let it. And she was one of those people that let it become part of her superpowers. Exactly, exactly. And that's why it's like when these articles are like the sad story of this depressed empress, where it's like, no, no, no. Or or as Netflix is trying to do the romantic story. Oh, my God. Yeah. So listeners, as we were planning for this episode, I came there's a trailer for this new show. I think it's coming up. This episode is airing in like September. So the show is maybe the show is maybe already on on Netflix, but it's like a German show. And it's about young CC and it's very much which like first of all I'm always in favor of any media representation of women from history the more the better the more that we can get these stories out there and these names known great comma and <laughs> the presentation of the story is very much like CC and Franz a love story and if we've done anything hopefully we're convincing you that this is not a love story <laughs> that's not what this narrative is it's not that- the worst marriage in the history of vulgar history, <laughs> but it is not a love story. I'm going to say it's probably one of the it's better. It's not Victoria and Albert. That's for sure. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, I don't know. A love story or is that just a sex fiend story? <laughs> the tricky is, well, and this is the thing, like we're going to talk about the like various CC movies and things at the end, but like even the biographies of her, like she's so, like, we're, we're going to be talking about this for, I don't even know, 12 hours. But like, she's such a complex person and there's so many things to the story, but it's like, it's tempting for her, like for women in history, for anyone and for any historical narrative, like there's an instinct that I have in myself to just, every time I message you, I'm like, Lana, is it like this? It's like, oh, is it like this? And you're like, no, it's not. It's like, it's, this is Cece. This is her story. But it's like, oh, but I want to make it fit into a predetermined narrative with which I am familiar. And it's like, no, it's not a Cinderella story. It's not a Princess Diana story. It's not... But people are like, well, what if we make it be a love story? What if we make it be a tragedy? And it's like, or you could just let it be like a twisty, turny story of like a cool woman who like did what she could. I mean, it's kind of a soap opera. It's, it's, she's, she's, a, she's, a tragic, she's a tragic figure, but she doesn't, she would fight you. She would fight you if you called her tragic. <laughs> And that's the thing too. It's the thing that I come across with my other like OTP, which is Mary Queen of Scots, where so much like people focus on like, and her story ended like this. And retroactively, it's like, as though that makes her life tragic. Like no one, like, I don't want to call anyone's life tragic just because of how it ends. Like all of our lives end with us dying. And Calls but, uh, Mary Queen of Scots a victim did not actually understand anything about Mary Queen of Scots is all uh, I've ever said. <laughs> well, here's what I'm going to say. Vulgar history season six, but you don't call it, de- you don't call it the geese of victim. Like, <laughs> no. So that's the thing. So I think Cece, like she, like there's sad parts of her story, but it's not a sad story. There's right. like, victories and she had fun and there was like stuff she did but it's like her life is not sad it's not a sad story and i think the benefit of that is the the, i think what benefits her most is the modern times is that we have so much about her in so many different ways like there's news articles about her there's yeah there's like there's firsthand accounts of people that were living in the 1900s like it's not it's not quite the same as well, we've found two pieces of primary sources we can rub together to make a picture of someone. It's, yeah. It, there's, a, there's a lot about her and that that makes it much harder to like rub her edges off and, yeah. and make her round and, and turn her into a fairy tale. She's not a fairy tale. She's a complicated human being. The movies that came out, so the Romy Schneider is the actress who plays, there was like three movies made in Germany about her. Romy Schneider I, looks a whole a lot like her in the pictures I've seen from those movies. And then the movies were combined into one movie. That's 
some some involvement in your book. I know because I saw her name. No, um, there's actually I I cannot remember off the top of my head who it is, but there is a young adult author who for every Christmas, every Christmas watches all three CC movies. And that's their thing. Like CC is, is a secret young adult author stand, <laughs> especially in the queer community for some reason. So, so the thing with CC, so there is, she is one of the Royal diaries. Like there is a Royal diaries about CC and it ends, I think with her marriage. Cause it's her like ages 14, 15. <laughs> And that's a good time to, if, if she could have ended her story that way without like dying, just like yeah. that. And then forever, she's a 15 year old. She would have done that so fast. I don't know. And what you just said about with the queer community, it's, I don't know. I feel like the way that the regular people loved her reminds me of that sort of thing of people who like the queer community rallying behind like Whitney Houston or Britney Spears or somebody just sort of like a woman who faces so much adversity and personal challenge and like mental things but like the queer community is just like we stand like i don't know i think she has things in common with those sorts of figures i have to think that through more thoroughly anyway while this these victories are happening she was still having her like vienna based constant triggering of mental health issues so at one point like her coughing slash panic attacks got to a point where they're like does she have tuberculosis so a lung specialist um, advised to stay on Madeira, which is in Portugal, question mark, I think. Now, now you're making a question myself, so I'm going to check. I put that in my notes for myself and I trust my past self. But anyway, it was sort of a thing where it's like, she went, so they're like, I think she just really needs, and I appreciate, someone just, there was like a viral tweet I saw yesterday where it's just like, can we bring back like a seaside cure? Can we just like send people to to the beaches more and i'm i'm like sure i would do that anyway they're like let's just get her out on the fresh air i think that'll be good for her lungs etc and the minute she left vienna she's just like i'm good it's like, an island known by port owned by portugal north of the canary islands so okay. like yes it's a really good place for fresh air and her to be as far away as humanly possible yeah. from as many people as she can it was in the biography i think i read it was something about like she like she so, and I think some of her siblings got to go there with her. Like that was another thing, like being away from her siblings was really, really hard for her because they were all really close and really tight. She wasn't allowed to have a confidant because as empress, that wasn't seen like appropriate. Anyway, so she went to Madeira, her siblings were there and everyone's like, she like got better really suspiciously quickly. So they're like, was she faking? It's like, or was she like triggered by living here? And then you removed her from that situation and now she can like flourish and thrive. She stayed there for two years. <laughs> Just like, I feel like having a nice time. Look, if you can't do what you want to do as Empress, when can you do what you want to do? Um, eventually, she was just like, this is great. I'll stay here forever. And they're like, Ugh. there's a lot of gossip about her absence. And she's like, what's that? Gossip about my absence? I'm just going to go to Bavaria for like two more years and just like hang out with my family Eventually, she returned to Vienna shortly before her husband's birthday and immediately suffered from a violent migraine and vomited four times en route. So she doesn't like being in Vienna. Her body is rejecting her reentry. Like her body was just being like, nope, not going to let this happen. So her husband wanted another son to safeguard the succession, but her doctor claimed her health would not permit another pregnancy. And I'm sure it wouldn't. Although I wonder how much she paid that doctor. (laughs) So she spent a lot of time leaving court to go get treatment at various spas. Good for you. Let's see a quote from her. So she also was intentionally avoiding pregnancy. She said, quote, children are the curse of a woman for when they come, they drive away beauty, which is the best gift of the gods. That's body dysmorphia in one quote. Not that I, not that I disagree with childlessness because I am also childless, but. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, th- I, I don't know. We, we had that whole section, but like, if this is your, like, what does pregnancy do to a person with body dysmorphia? I'm sure nothing good. So of course she wants to avoid it. But then in 1868, she finally, quote, finally agreed to have a fourth child for political reasons. So back to Hungary. So her decision was at once a deliberate personal choice and a political negotiation. (laughs) She figured by returning to her marriage, like her marital bed, she could like 
hold this over Franz Joseph to like finally get the like Austria Hungary thing to happen. She wanted to have a, her fourth child to be born in Hungary, like sort of symbolically to be like, this is yeah. So arguably he did know how to get what he wanted out of her by giving her what she wanted, <laughs> which again is not a thing that normally would have happened in most uh, Royal marriages, but they came to this compromise where like she agreed to give him a child and he agreed to <laughs> form the kingdom of Austria, Hungary. He agreed to recognize Hungary as an equal partner. <laughs> yeah. So, in 1867, and largely due to Sisi's diplomatic work, Hungary became an equal partner in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Franz Joseph was crowned king of Hungary, and Sisi became queen with Andrasi as prime minister. For her part in the Austro-Hungarian Compromise of 1867, Sisi was beloved by the Hungarian people who were also given new freedoms as equals to the Austrians. And I think there was a big coronation situation, you know, very exciting for everybody. Hungary presented the royal couple with a country residence in Godolo. A word with. I don't know how to help with that one. There's a lot of umlauts in that word, just know. A lot of umlauts. Umlauta. Godolo. Anyway, Hungary presented them with a country residence 32 kilometers, 20 miles east of Budapest. And Sisi was like, great, I'm just going to live here basically permanently and do horseback riding for the rest of my life. So the next year she lived primarily. It was basically a hunting lodge. Yeah. Like it, it was very much Balmoral for the Austro-Hungarians. Well, and this is where I think she really um, starts getting into horseback riding, fox hunting. So she lived primarily there. And this is where she became like she's pregnant living there. The people of Austria were just like, why, why doesn't she want to live here in Vienna where we were cruel to her the entire time? Like, why would she ever leave us? And they're all like, oh, she must be, you know, Andrasi must be the father of this baby. They made like a mean joke saying that she would, if it was a son, she would call him Stephen after the patron saint and first king of Hungary. It would be so uh, terrible if she names him after a Hungarian. People in Vienna just, anyway. <laughs> they're a lot and I love them and they're terrible and I love them. <laughs> I do, I do. It was a city, 100% population, messy bitches living for drama. <laughs> So anyway, so Austria is like super chill. And then Vienna is like, no, oh. we're going hard. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, it was not a daughter. It was, sorry, it was not a son. It was a daughter who she called Marie Valerie, who was known as the Hungarian child. So she was born because, in Budapest. Because it really is. A, is it really a Habsburg baby if it's not named Marie? <laughs> I will say Valerie is the first time I've had someone called Valerie on this podcast ever. There's also someone called Stephanie. Anyway, Marie Valerie, known as Valerie, is the Hungarian child who's born in Budapest, um, baptized there. And then she was plagued her whole life by rumors that her father was secretly Andrasi, but like she looked like her father, who was Franz Joseph. And Sisi and Andrasi were not lovers because if nothing else, they were both extremely closely monitored at all times by people who would have noticed something like that happening. Cece was never alone, ever, ever alone, <laughs> no. as much as she wanted to be. Yeah, there's one of the sections of this I almost want to call like Cece wants to be alone, trademark Greta Garbo. Anyway, so Valerie, Cece was just like, here's what's happening. I'm going to raise this child and no one's going to take her away. I think Sophie was dead by now. But anyway, this was the one Sophie child. Was dead way before, like yeah. Sophie was dead, I think, before um, Rudolph was even or he, when he was still really, really young. I forget, yeah. Anyway, but she was just like, this is, it would have been a while since Rudolph was born. So she's just like, I'm going to raise this child myself. And she did. And she was very close to Valerie in a way she was not with any further children, but partially because she was able to be. A lot of what was written about Cece, like, or like the reference in a lot of the biographies are Valerie's notes because she was so close to her mother. She knew her mother very, very well. Um, yeah. So, but here's the thing. And I love this for her. So after having achieved the victory of the Austria-Hungary matter, Cece was like, here's what's happening. I'm just going to travel the world for the rest of my life. Goodbye, Vienna. She just embarked on a life of travel and saw little of her children, except for Valerie, I think, traveled with her sometimes. Here's a quote from her. If I arrived at a place and knew that I could never leave it again, the whole stay would become hell despite being paradise. She hated feeling trapped, which is what Vienna, Vienna was a trap. Yeah. 
it's the very it's like the the bird in a gilded cage situation where it's like some people are like, well, why isn't she happy that she's like the empress and she gets like pretty dresses? And it's like she's not happy because she doesn't want that because that doesn't make her happy because it was literally prison. Like she didn't like suddenly she was like if she were in fact ADHD and she were untreated, which there was no treatment at the time that would like, it it was that I have to be moving. I have to follow, you have to follow the muse like that. If that was the thing, it makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense that she never wanted to be like Vienna was, a was, was rules and structure and everything she couldn't be. Mm -hmm. So even if they want, no matter how much they wanted her, no matter how hard they tried, she could never be Vienna. Yeah. But if they let her float around, she'd do whatever they needed her to do. Exactly. So I think at this point in her life, she is just like, she's just traveling. That is that is what is happening. And she's just like, I am going to be in Vienna almost never. And I'm just going to, exactly like you just said, just like follow the muse, place to place. So newspapers, because this is like the late... 19th century Um, newspapers covered her travels as a public figure um, because you know she is the empress Um, she is a public figure but she's also famously beautiful etc so um, and all the articles were like here's her exercise regime here's her diet plan but also like she's doing a lot of horseback riding so people are like she's to go to horseback riding like here's what her outfits were like she often shopped at the budapest fashion house Antal altar now altar is Kiss, which had become very popular with the fashion crazed crowd. Newspapers reported on a series of reputed lovers because, like, that's going to sell you newspapers to. because they wanted that just as a thing people wanted to read about, even though it's. Oh, this is this is yellow journalism, babe. Yeah, yeah. This is make up anything you want. We got to publish it. We got to sell papers. We're making money. This is yeah. like, yeah, this yeah. Is Newsies era almost for the, the American public. Speaking of newsies, we're going to do that in Vulgar Peace Theater at some point, and I'm excited about it. Spoilers. (laughs) Well, we don't know when. But yeah, I think also it's like the same as the movies are like, well, let's make this a love story. It's like people can't like a story that sells is like a beautiful woman and her lover, a beautiful woman and her love triangle. If it's just like a beautiful woman who's just like having a fun trip with her ladies in waiting. It's just like, well, that's not, there's not a sexy angle to that. Like they needed to make something be scandalous about it. If she had a lover, it was probably her horse. And she, was, she was a horse girl. Oh the beginning, my she was a horse girl. God. If you want to, if you want to pair her in a romantic story, you, you do a horse girl story. That's beginning and end. Okay. So we're going to leave it there for CC part two. Next week, we're going to do part three which will, well, the, truly the third act of her life and what, what she was up to. So stay tuned for that next week. Until then, all the regular reminders. Oh, also next week, there's going to be the scoring. So like, we'll see how this goes. Because Cece, not a typical vulgar history type person in terms of the four categories we're scoring, but we'll see how that turns out. So if you have feedback, comments, questions, you just want to like say, hey, um, you can reach out if you go to vulgarhistory.com. There's a button there where you can contact me to send messages. You can also send me a DM on Instagram where we are at Vulgar History Pod, where I've been posting lots and lots and lots of images of Cece herself because she was a woman who had a lot of portraits painted of her. A lot of portraits have been done afterwards following her life of people inspired by her, um, the Cece stars, her hairstyle pretty iconic anyway instagram we're at vulgar history pod on twitter i'm at vulgar history and if you want to follow on patreon that is if you go to patreon.com slash and foster writer that's where so if you pledge a dollar at least a dollar per month you get early access to episodes if you pledge at least two dollars a month you get early access to episodes and you can vote on polls like all the people who voted the patreon people voted for cc to do an episode about her so That's how you can help me decide because sometimes I can't make up my mind. And then if you pledge at least $5 a month, then you get access to all the bonus episodes. That's the So This Asshole episodes about men from history. Most recently, I've done one about Louis XIV. We'll see. Oh, and then next one I'm going to be doing is Christopher Columbus. Also a vote from the PP on Patreon. So just reading up on him as well. Anyway, and then also the Vulgar Peace Theater episodes with uh, Lana Johnson. 
who you're now very familiar with um, from these episodes, and Alison Epstein, where we talk about costume dramas. The most recent one we discuss is Les Miserables, the Hugh Jackman movie. Anyway, patreon.com slash writer. And yeah, if you want to support the show via merch, um, that's all for sale at vulgarhistory.store. I'm thinking about something for Cece, something horse girl related, long hair, don't care. I'm not sure. This is where like send me a message. What do you think? Anyway, if you're shopping on vulgarhistory.store, you can use code TITSOUT for free US shipping or TITSOUT10 for 10% off if you're not in the US. And yeah, so next week, we're going to wrap things up with Cece. So until then, keep your hair down, pants on, and your tits out. Vulgar History is hosted, written, and researched by Anne Foster and edited by Christina Lumagi. Welcome to the small town of Chinook, where faith runs deep and secrets run deeper. In this new thriller, religion and crime collide when a gruesome murder rocks the isolated Montana community. Everyone is quick to point their fingers at a drug-addicted teenager, but local deputy Ruth Vogel isn't convinced. She suspects connections to a powerful religious group. Enter federal agent VB Loro, who has been investigating a local church for possible criminal activity. The pair form an unlikely partnership to catch the killer, unearthing secrets that leave Ruth torn between her duty to the law, her religious convictions, and her very own family. But something more sinister than murder is afoot, and someone is watching Ruth. Chinook, starring Kelly Marie Tran and Sanaa Lathan. Listen to Chinook wherever you get your podcasts. Nowadays, trends and news cycles change faster than we can blink. But there are some things that withstand the test of time. And if you're looking for a connection to something timeless, and maybe also a glimpse of life at a slower pace, I believe everyone can relate to the very human experiences explored in Jane Austen's novels. And that's where I come in. My name is Alison Larkin. I'm a writer, comedian, and narrator and host of The Jane Austen Podcast with Alison Larkin. I spent a lot of my childhood in the part of England where Jane Austen lived and wrote, and now that I live in the States, nothing gives me a sense of homecoming quite like narrating her books. On this show, you'll listen to award-winning narration. I'll give myself a pat on the back for that as well as conversations with actors, writers and other fascinating people who all share a passionate love for Jane Austen. So please, join me as we embark on a wonderful journey through Jane Austen's work. Be sure to listen and subscribe to The Jane Austen Podcast with Alison Larkin wherever you get your podcasts.